180 million people no more wanted to be communist slaves than we do. Seven people. Well, now we've got 25,000. It's a very eminent, urgent, day-to-day -day danger. Well, Senator Joseph McCarthy stoking fear of communism during the 50s, of course, servicing the American public to pleasures of the Red Scare. Fear, of course, the political weapon of choice throughout history. But today's antics taking it to a whole new level and a whole new level of profitability. We're breaking it down from duck and cover drill instruction for possible nuke attacks back in the day, complete with cartoon turtle, to the anti-drug film Reefer Madness, depicting the perils of marijuana. Scare tactics of the past seem sort of silly, of course, when you look at what we're all seeing today. Do the easy stuff now. Prepare yourself for what we all hope won't happen, but probably will if you're not prepared. Thanks. Uh, Glenn Beck hoping to take control of the country through uh, predicting an apocalypse, hoping the apocalypse happens, and then profiting from the sale of apocalypse-related materials. It's a good business model. Once again, fear sells. The end day is certainly right around the corner. If Mr. Beck has gone from hawking gold to pitching freeze-dried lasagna, the worse he can make it, the better off he does. I think he cleared $30 million last year. Anyway, then you got this one in Colorado showing a skeletal angel of death morphing into the face of President Obama. But we all know why they use fear, because nothing more easily rewards an individual without morals or without any real conscience whatsoever with money and power than scaring the crap out of a bunch of people with lies and then selling them a book or some other nonsense that will save them. Here to help us from walking off that ledge and stopping us from jumping at our own shadows, also perhaps advising some friends who are suffering from some of these fears, Tony Schwartz for our first Thursdays with Tony spot, so we can actually get to the root of our problems, which is the corrupt political decision-making process made in secret by a monopoly oligopoly system that they use fear to distract you from that fact so that they don't actually have to fix it. Tony, of course, author of The Way We're Working Isn't Working, CEO of The Energy Project. It's a pleasure to have you back. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So uh, we won't have to prosecute a big case that fear is effective. It's obviously effective. We know it's effective. Uh, what seems to be unclear is uh, the effective uh, tamping down of the fear. Uh, how do you even begin the process of diminishing the level of fearfulness that is promoted by everybody from, I won't name a bunch of names, but how do you do this? Well, you know, the first way you do it is to help people understand that fear isn't doing them any good, that fear makes you stupid. And it literally makes you stupid. In other words, what do you what, mean? Well, what's happening when you feel fear is you're moving into that state, that physiological state known as fight or flight. And you're getting a surge of hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and what it does is it shuts down your prefrontal cortex. It literally makes it so you can't think, and all you do is react. And when all you do is react, you don't necessarily do something intelligent. So if you look at the, con the founding fathers in this country and the basic principle of the social contract, that decisions are that it's not us and th that it's not us and them, that it is us, that decisions must be resolved in the context of that social contract. And then you look at the rhetoric that comes out of Sarah Palin's mouth, or the rhetoric that comes out of some of the Democratic leadership's mouth, or the rhetoric that comes out of some of the Republican leadership's mouth, all of which is basically pre on the premise of Mama Grizzly Bear going to protect you. And, and if you think about how a Mama Grizzly works, a Mama Grizzly could care less whether she eats all of your children, all the neighbor's children, whether she burns the entire neighborhood down, as long as she gratifies her emotional desire and her terrified ego to protect her own family, which of course requires the annihilation of the social contract. Contract. Fear basically makes it okay to destroy everybody else around you, fair? Yeah, it's true, and in fact, I don't even think that, the, that most politicians are out there saying, I'll protect you. All they're saying is the other guy will kill you. In other words, it's about the other person. That's how you, what they want to do is generate not protectiveness. They want to generate fear because they know that fear narrows your vision. It puts you in a state of, show me what to do. And you know what, it's, it's a little bit like when people go into the voting booth on, on, on election day now, it's a little bit like uh, they've gone out late at night, uh, gotten a little too drunk, 
taken somebody home, ended up in the morning with that person in the bed because they were drunk when they were doing the, doing the activity, ends up with a person in bed that they don't want to be there with. And that's what's going to happen to a lot of people if they respond to, in this election cycle to fear. They're going at, to yeah. at the same time, we have an election system that is not dominated by transparency or competition, but is dominated by an opaque operating system of secret money and a monopoly primary system that rewards the most extreme and punishes the most moderate. So what if what you're afraid of is not the other guy, but you're afraid that you have an opaque monopoly political system that is only catering to the special interests that are able to manipulate it, and your fear is, I don't have any political candidates, Harry Reid or Sharon Angle, or pick over your mix, mix and match, Andrew Cuomo, who refuses to deal with the banks in this state, or Carl Palladino, who's nuts, neither one's very appealing. So what if your fear is based on the fact that the system is generating worse and worse political leaders, rewarding worse and worse individuals who are more exploitative, more destructive, more irrational, uh, and more extreme? Here's the thing. It's not about that, that judging or assessing whether that observation is right or wrong. It's about whether the right response to it is fear. You see, fear is so undermining. Fear makes us weaker, not stronger. And so wouldn't it be better to say, I observe and feel unhappy about, even, you know, uh, even motivated to do something about what I see, but not get stuck in that state that immobilizes you and that's what's that's what's I feel like we have a country full of immobilized people because they're at that point that you're describing and I do sense a theme here Dylan do I not yes, I've heard this course. I've heard this before I remember it the last time I was here which is you know how do I get myself into a more optimistic state of mind when the world is full how of things to be pessimistic engage about just all these problems yeah. as opposed to rebehaving like a monkey yeah well the problem is that that the in some sense when you run the story of all the things that are wrong, what, what it does is it stirs up the fear only more. And so the question is, to hold the reality on the one hand, yes, this is a very difficult time. There's not a whole lot externally to believe in when it comes to politics. But on the other hand, I have the capacity to keep doing what I do and to push to push for what I believe in and for what I care about each and every day. And that's what energizes me positively. You know, the fear is a fuel that runs out very, very quickly because it's like a gas-guzzling car, fear. Fear, is a, fear, is, fear guzzles gas. I like it. That's a pleasure. Hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you. Thursdays with Tony. This will be your first Thursday. Author of The Way We're Working Isn't Working, CEO of The Energy Project, and a good guy, Tony Schwartz.